Sage Wonder here and welcome to Coffee Talk! So, today I bring you the conspiracy of the Mount St. Helens Bigfoot cover-up. Dun, dun, dun. I gotta say, this is the biggest development in Bigfoot story and mythology that's come along, I think, in my lifetime. And I cannot believe I'm just now hearing this story. So, uh, if you've seen the, the documentaries on this, then uh, bear with me and follow along and we'll have a discussion about it. But, this, um, this conspiracy is based around the uh, confession of three individuals who were involved in the emergency response to the Mount St. Helens eruption in uh, Washington State in 1980, in May 18th of 1980. Now, Mount St. Helens is right across the border from, uh, from Oregon. It's in Washington, but just barely. It's really just right across the river from Portland. And so, uh, it's one of the many mountains that, on a clear day, you can see from uh, my van down by the river. <laughs> and um, although it's one of the furthest mountains, it's kind of hard for you to see it. But on a clear day, you get in the right location from, uh, from uh, well, from Portland, from the bridges in Portland, it's very visible. And now it has a, a flat top and kind of a missing side of the mountain. Because uh, if you aren't aware of this historical fact, <laughs> in 1980 this uh, mountain erupted because it was a dormant volcano. It spewed a mini mile high ash column into the, into the uh, stratosphere and spread uh, ash across 17 states. Now, I was a young kid living in the Willamette Valley at the time. And I watched the event take place from my patio. The ash that settled on us was uh, was so deep that it was like snow and had to be shoveled from the driveways, uh, the gutters, and all of the um, and all the draining systems were completely clogged with this gray uh, ash, which was the uh, the earth and rock that was just basically blown to bits and burned and, and, uh, and reduced to ashes. And this, uh, <clears throat> this ash bothered a lot of people who had asthma and things like that. In fact, I have a distinct memory of my grandmother putting a little surgical mask on her Pomeranian so that he didn't have to breathe in all of that stuff because it was making him sneeze, sneeze and cough all of the, <laughs> all of the ash. So this Bigfoot story that I'm bringing you on Coffee Talk is based on three eyewitnesses who are uh, who've made confessions. One of them was a a timber company employee, a warehouser employee. The other one was a National Guardsman, and the third one was an Air Force officer or Air Force. I don't know. I don't know their ranks. He was a low-level Air Force guy, and. Um, their stories, I could tell you each one of their perspectives separately, but they kind of all tell the same sort of story. So if you go and watch the videos on this, the other videos on this topic, you will get each of the three eyewitness accounts. And, and essentially they're letters that were written anonymously. And, um, uh, and then the, the documentary tells the story and shows a lot of cool pictures, you know, a lot of uh, made up pictures of Bigfoot and that sort of thing. But what I'm going to do for the Coffee Talk is combine the three stories kind of into a narrative because they support each other and we're just going to go on the assumption that they're telling us the truth and that they're revealing uh, this uh, incident uh, around Mount St. Helens that was a cover-up by the United States government. Do, 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 what else is new? They cover up everything. So, especially their own wrongdoing. Um... But let's, uh, let's give you this basic deal. The warehouser guy, he claims that he saw bodies of, of uh, Bigfoots. Now, you got to understand, they evacuated and told everyone to evacuate the Mount St. Helens area. This is not something that uh, happened without some kind of warning. We all knew this was coming. They told us, it's going to happen. I remember there was one old guy who happened to be named Harry Truman, although he was no... 
relative to Harry Truman. Um, but he was just an old mountain man that lived up there on Spirit Lake, and he refused to leave. And they tried to make him leave, and he wouldn't leave. They even wrote a song about old Harry Truman because he was killed when the mountain went up, along with about 60 other people who either wouldn't leave or thought they were far enough away and wouldn't be affected by it because it was much bigger than anyone thought. But what? But who didn't get the the uh, who didn't get the word were all of the animals. Uh, no animals were evacuated. They were all killed. Thousands of elk, thousands of deer, hundreds of bears. And during the cleanup process, immediately following it, they were collecting these carcasses and piling them up and burning them uh, to prevent disease being spread. <clears throat> And other just unsightly deals. You know, if you found if they found a body, they would they would have a helicopter pick it up and take it to a location and pile it up. So you had a pile of dead deer, a pile of dead elk, a pile of dead bears, and a pile of dead Bigfoot. Don't don't don't. This warehouser employee claims that there was a pile of dead Bigfoots there with the other dead animals. The the bodies were covered with a tarp. And, uh, but he did see them adding uh, bodies to it, and he did see, he claims to see dead, I've uh, seen dead uh, Bigfoot bodies in that pile, which would make sense if you believe in Bigfoot. That's something they can't hide from. They can hide from us, they can hide from the camera, they're probably smart enough to know what a trail cam is, but uh, they cannot hide from a volcano. Nobody can. So, apparently, there was a bunch of dead Bigfoots. Which leads me to the next eyewitness. Um, this guy tells the story that, and this is the National Guard uh, uh, employee. He was the most detailed of all the stories, the National Guardsman. And he was told afterwards, you know, not to ever speak of this again. You know, give it about 30 years. In 30 years, everyone will know and it won't be a big deal. <laughs> they still haven't really revealed what they know about Bigfoot in 30 years. <clears throat> but he felt like it freed him up to tell his story. And he claims that he was uh, requisitioned for guard duty on a special mission along with some other men. And that they were taken to a medical tent uh, where doctors were coming and going and people were in and out. And he claims that uh, he was told that he was going to be escorting... Uh, a special mission to retrieve some victims and to help some victims of the uh, of the blast, and that out of the out of this hospital tent came a civilian, pretty much walking arm in arm with an extremely tall Bigfoot, a classic Bigfoot covered in hair, uh, you know, standing over. Uh, this guy didn't give us a height, but he he just called him extremely tall, heads and shoulders above everyone else. And that this civilian was, get this, speaking back and forth and conversing with this Bigfoot. Don't, don't, don't. Apparently, back in 1980, did, did the government not only know there were Bigfoots, but is covering up that there's people, apparently, who have mastered the language of the Bigfoot. And that this guy just spoke to these Bigfoots in their own language. Don't, don't, don't. That's a first. I never heard that one. So, anyway, um, apparently they take this Bigfoot in this convoy trucks with all these armed men and they go out in the woods in search of Bigfoot survivors and bodies. And this Bigfoot leads them to these lava caves, these volcanic caves from previous uh, volcanic eruptions. That's what most of our caves are in Oregon, lava tubes. So, he takes these... Uh, this Bigfoot takes these men around and they go to these areas where these lava tubes are and he yells out a call. And in the first location, nothing comes out. In the second location, uh, they hear a faint cry and they go into one of these caves following this Bigfoot. And they pull out this Bigfoot who is badly burned and is honestly beyond saving. And after the one Bigfoot kind of s explains what's going on to the other Bigfoot and says goodbye to him, they walk off and a guardsman is ordered to shoot and kill the Bigfoot as euthanization. So they euthanized him to give him re uh, relief from his pain because he was unsavable. There was no way he was going to live. And he was badly, badly burned from the volcanic eruption, from the hot ash. It was just like the ash was on fire when it was coming down there around the mountain. 
Well, it's a pyroclastic flow. It's it's hot, burning ash flying through the air. I mean, I don't know how anything survived it. They probably only survived it because they were hiding in these old lava tubes in these caves. So they go on and they find several Bigfoot survivors and they take them back to this medical tent for treatment. And the eyewitness said that this one Bigfoot who was going around doing this really uh, dark but important job was very human-like and uh, showed somber emotion and showed real um, uh, sort of mourning. He was mourning the loss of all of his fellow Bigfoots and this horrible catastrophe that had happened to them. And apparently there were dozens of Bigfoot bodies, multiple Bigfoot survivors who were treated and then released back into the wild. And to this day, if you Google uh, Bigfoot encounters, you'll come up with many, many around the now recovering Mount St. Helens area where you've got now, what, 30 years of growth of... Um, you know, it's, it's yeah, it's a long time, <laughs> 30 plus years of growth and uh, overgrowth and underbrush coming up. And now you've got the ideal environment. And uh, many people are encountering these Mount St. Helens Bigfoots who survived with the help of the U.S. government, apparently. Don't, don't, don't. The third U U.S. Air Force guy claimed he was drafted into guard duty to guard a similar hospital tent, maybe the exact hospital tent, that the National Guardsman was called in to go on this uh, recon mission into this devastated area to rescue Bigfoots. The National Guardsman says that they set down all the Guardsmen at the end of this uh, mission and told them, look, do you really need us to explain to you what's happened here? <clears throat> These people and that's the thing he called them people he referred to them as victims and survivors and this government employee called these bigfoot people and he told the uh the guardsmen these people just want to be left alone you know they're so much like us and they have the right to live however they want and they deserve to be left alone and not harassed and that by telling anyone what's happened here you could put them at risk and put their way of life at risk and these people just want to be left alone and you know if you want to talk about it wait 30 years it won't matter then now did he mean because he thought they would be extinct or do you think he said that because he thought sooner or later the government's going to disclose what they know about the Bigfoot people don't 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 Bigfoot are people they're not apes they're people are they the missing link? See my video, What is a Bigfoot, from last week. I've been thinking a lot about Bigfoot, and you can see I got the big man there on my shirt. But, uh, yeah, what do you think? Did Mount St. Helens give us once and for all uh, uh, absolute proof? Is there a cover-up that Bigfoot is real and that Bigfoot was a, a victim like the rest of us of the Mount St. Helens explosion? You know, I'll never forget watching that mushroom cloud rise up from my patio. And when I was a little kid in Salem, I could see it, uh, you know, going up into the stratosphere, this many mile high cloud that looked just like all of the nuclear explosions I'd ever seen. And apparently this this explosion was way bigger than your average nuke. So what do you think? Is there a cover up? Have you heard this story before? What do you know about the Mount St. Helens Bigfoot cover up? Talk about it in the comments section. Thanks. See you again on Coffee Talk.